Surrender is not a bad word when you're surrendering to Jesus, right? Just, I got so much going on in my life, so much messed up, and I just surrender. Jesus, you're the Lord. It's all you. Uh, you know, I was thinking this week about that we've got a lot of cliches. You know, a cliche can be useful, and there, there's a reason it's a cliche. It's used often because there's just some element of truth there. But we have li- cliches in our lexicon of ready-made Christian phrases that can actually lead to bad theology. And when I say them, you're going to think, oh, yeah, I say that, and, and I say that. And you're going to think, oh, yeah, every Christian says that, says that. The reason we say it is because there's some truth to it. But if we're not careful, we take these phrases places where they shouldn't go. These are lines that we just dump out sometimes. It's like we're on, on uh, autoplay, and without much thought, it's, it's kind of a, you know how boy bands are called a prefab band today? You, you just put, plug in and put, plug in different people. This is like prefab theology. Prefab theology, it's just a response. It's like a gut reaction response. And brothers, sisters, it's bad for us. It's okay to say it if we're being thoughtful. It's not okay to say it when we're leading ourselves and possibly other people to some very dangerous places. Uh, we need to be careful. Sometimes they're okay. Sometimes they are not okay. Uh, first one. Yeah, I had to learn things the hard way. You ever hear people say that? You ever say that yourself maybe? It's good if we actually did learn. <laughs> it's bad if we're using that as an excuse for that's just the kind of person I am. I never get it right the first time. I've got to learn it the hard way. So what? You're nullifying the work of the Holy Spirit to tell me that you're bigger than God? I had to learn things the hard way? It's a great saying if it means what it's supposed to mean, that I went through a hard time and I learned my lesson. I learned. We all recognize, of course, that it would be better if we learned before the hard time, right? I mean, if I'm heading towards this wall, and uh, I'm just going to whack that wall and see what happens, and I'm going to do it with my forehead, and I'm getting ready, sometime between here and there, if I say, wait a second, that would be better, right? And yet, how often, especially I want to talk to husbands and wives, you have the same argument again and again and again. Come on, you know you're getting ready to whack your head on the wall. It's time to back up before you get there. Some people, so it's better to learn before we suffer. Some people never learn, and others learn the hard way through experiencing pain from their bad choices. A wise person can learn from the experience of others. I don't have to suffer because, boy, I just saw Billy go over there and run his head on the ground. He's, man, he's bleeding from the forehead. I think I won't do that, you know? (laughs) Sorry, Bill. He's a Bear fan, so it's okay. So, (laughs) preach on, I heard it. I'm not going to stop now. (laughs) So, we we see somebody else make an error, and we say, that's not working out. You know, how's that doing for them? It's not. And so, we say, I don't want to go the direction they're going because it doesn't work. But a really, really, really wise person would learn to choose wisely in life without themselves having to suffer or anyone else having to suffer. You just say, hey, wait a second, this is not right. This is the path the Lord's given us. Uh, Even though uh, I'm not seeing anybody else's life self-destructing around me, I know better than to go that direction. I don't need to see uh, a visual object lesson. The problem with the saying is that we can take it too far and we can think, I had to learn something the hard way. And we start to think, if something is too hard, then it'd be best if I just avoided it altogether. If something's hard, because I, I, I had to learn the hard way, but maybe it'd just be better if I avoided hardship altogether. Now, it's okay if we're talking about walls, but what if it talks about another 10 years of marriage? Well, I learned things the hard way. I'm getting out of this marriage. Oh, wait a second. You see? How that, that just gut reaction, we just toss out these, these little spiritual phrases, learn things the hard way, and if we're not careful, they can take us to dark places. Another s- a second cliche is, 
I knew it was God because he opened some doors for me. And we understand this. I understand this. Our church understands this. Sometimes a situation just looks impossible. And you know why it looks impossible? Because it is impossible. This situation, this person, it's impossible. This person is never going to come to church. They're never going to fall on their knees before holy God. It's impossible. This situation is never going to uh, rectify itself. There can never be restoration in this relationship. There can never be forgiveness. It's impossible. And you are absolutely right. And don't let anybody tell you different. It's impossible with you and me, with man. But what's impossible with us is possible with the Lord. Sometimes the situation just looks like there's no way out and something miraculous happens and we find the answer we were looking for. Amen. Thank you, God. There are two potential problems with this phrase, though. I knew it was God because he opened doors. There's problems with that? Yeah. When it's just this prefab theology that we're not thinking through. Taken to an extreme. One. God is not the only one who can open doors. The drug dealer can open doors for you. Here's a gateway. Here's an easy way. I'll give you this for free. Wow, I didn't have money for drugs. God must open the door for me. I mean, that's insane, right? But I'm using this extreme example because, brothers and sisters, just because the door opens doesn't mean you should walk through it. Amen. Amen. There are two potential problems again. One is that God's not the only one who opens doors. And two, taken to an extreme, it can cultivate this mentality in us that God only wants us to go through the path of least resistance. Uh, being a missionary would be hard. But look at this door opened up for me to do this or that or whatever. You see how that, it's, it's, it's a good phrase, God opens doors, that's good. But we got to be careful with it. This prefabricated theology can get us in trouble. Don't believe, because brothers and sisters, all over the world, maybe especially in the United States, there's Christians who think God owes them an easy life. And whenever they see something difficult on the horizon, they think, well, God don't want me to go there. And so we think God opens doors. That means God only wants me to do easy things, the path of least resistance. When we do it with big things, like moving, finding a spouse, or going to school, it's dangerous if we only go where the water flows easiest. Well, I know this gal is, is, is not a Christian. She doesn't love the Lord, but she likes me. Path of least resistance. God opened the door. No, he didn't. He did not. With big things, where I should, just, just because you have the ability to buy the house doesn't mean you should buy the house. We have to understand these big things, because we use it all the time in big things. We have to understand how silly it is with small things, like the drug dealer. Like, I didn't want to ruin my diet. But you know, the potato chips were two for a buck. God opened a way. I ate a whole bag of potato chips. He opened the door and I walked through. It was a miracle. And it was good. And it was the same with that hot fudge Sunday later in the day. <laughs> See, just because the door opens doesn't mean, you, I think I'm losing you here. <coughs> just because the door opens doesn't mean we should go through. Or, or I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know if I should buy a car or not. I really needed a car to get to work, in, uh, but I didn't really have the money. And then there's a guy who just left his car running at the gas station. I knew it was the Lord. And he, God didn't want me to have that debt. He didn't want me to have to borrow all that money. And so the Lord provided me with this beautiful car I would not have otherwise been able to get. Uh, we don't do that because we know it's foolish. We don't do that because we know that doesn't work. Uh, there's going to be serious problems later, right? With the drugs, with the dieting, with the stealing cars, brothers and sisters. Don't steal cars. Uh, we need to remember that as well, though, when we're thinking about buying a home and choosing a school, choosing a church to attend and, and getting married. 
uh, just because we pray and then a door suddenly opens up doesn't mean that we're not supposed to use wisdom and, and spiritual principles as revealed in Scripture. We need to be wise and careful. The title of today's sermon, last week we were in I Believe in Miracles, right? We saw God, Jesus is a, is a wonder-working Savior. God does miracles in our lives. And today the sermon title is When the Hard Way is the Right Way. When the hard way is the right way. Because we have this temptation, again, to think the path of least resistance, the easy way, that must be what God has for me. And brothers and sisters, that's not the biblical model. It's not here. Let's uh, turn to Matthew chapter 8. Next week, uh, Brother Mark, Pastor Mark, is going to be here. All day, it's going to be about how to share our faith, evangelism. It's going to start in the Sunday school class, come at 845. It's going to be in the uh, church service. We're going to have 845, right, Sunday school. It's going to be in the, uh, we're going to have this great cookout, bring food. Remember, bring more food than you're going to eat so that we can share it with other people. And then uh, in the evening after 6 uh, six o'clock service, we're going to watch a video together, and he's going to lead a discussion about sharing our faith. Let's all be here. Let's pack this place out. He's a wonderful speaker. He's got some, some great things to say, and I'm really, really looking forward to, uh, to, to that. And I just want to encourage us all to, to grab a whole bunch of people and, and be here next week. Okay, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 8, 18 through 22. And as I read this, I want you to keep in mind, I want you to think about this, uh, this contrast. The contrast between the way that we, and I'm talking about we in the church, in, in the church in America, a contrast between the way we share our faith in Jesus and the way Jesus himself spoke about following him. Because sadly, there's a disconnect. Modern American Christianity has a way of talking about Jesus that he didn't talk about himself. We tend to stress how good and wonderful it will be, and it is. Best thing in my life was to choose to follow Jesus, by far. It's wonderful. We, Jesus is good. God is good. But we can also try and make it sound easy, and it is not. The Christian life is not an easy life. It's a high calling. Jesus said, follow me, and where did he go? He went to the cross. He went to the gates of hell to snatch people away from eternal damnation. And Jesus says, follow me. And we all say, we all sing the Sunday school song. We say, okay, I'll follow Jesus. Because it's going to mean what? Well, sometimes it means hardship. Sometimes it means difficulty. By contrast to this easy, no pain version of the gospel we often share today, two people, two people ask Jesus permission to follow him. That we're, we run after people and say, oh, come, come to church, it's good, we have pizza. And, and, and well, we have barbecue, that's, that's good. And, and, and we, we, try to, we try to tell people it's going to be easy. It's gonna, it's, you don't really have to change your life. It's going to be, you know, Jesus and John the Baptist saying, repent, repent. And we say, no, 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 no. We set this low bar, <laughs> not the way it's in the gospel. By contrast, two people asked permission to follow him, and he turned around and explained how difficult the life of following him will be. When's the last time you tried evangelizing like that? In some ways... Life with Jesus is more difficult. Now, I want to make a caveat. Life is hard, and either you're going to do it with Jesus or without Jesus. But here's the honest truth. I hope I'm saying the truth, regardless of whether I raise my hand or not. But The honest truth is that there are a whole collection of problems that, brothers and sisters, if you walk out the church today and say, I'm not going to think about God again, you can avoid. There's a lot of things in your life you don't have to put up with if you're willing to turn your back on the one who died for you. 
the choice is ours. And Jesus wanted them to understand this choice. So for, from verse uh, 18 here. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the sea. But uh, the other side, like, what? Verse 18. Uh, Ma Matthew chapter 8, verse 18. What's the deal there? We're always trying to gather crowds. Incidentally, Jesus also gathered crowds by the things he did. He gathered a huge crowd so he could speak on the Mount of Olives. But Jesus saw the crowds, and he did exactly what a church growth strategist would tell you not to do. He moved. What? He saw the crowds. He says, I'm going to go over to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Follow me. It's a tough place. This, this is my mentality. This is my stuff mentality. No room for that. We give it up. It's the Lord's. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple came to him. Matthew wasn't here, but he's hearing this from the other disciples who were already there at that time. He's recording this. Why is this here? Isn't this interesting? He's talking about this great sermon and this momentum and all the miracles and the crowds are coming. And people come to Jesus and say, I want to follow you. <coughs> and he says, wait a second. Wait, have you really thought through what this is entails, what this is all about. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And he's not saying, he's not saying, listen, he's not saying my dad just died and they're having the funeral. What he's saying, let me bury my father the, in, the, in that culture meant my dad's on his last leg. It could be a few weeks, a few months, a couple years. And I'm going to follow you someday. You think that sounds ridiculous? Well, school's real busy right now. I'm not going to follow the Lord now. I'll follow him later. I'm in a tough spot in this relationship right now. I'm not going to follow the Lord now. I'll follow him later. Work, as soon as I'm done with this, with this difficult time, or as soon as I change jobs, then I'll follow God. And what did Jesus say? Jesus didn't put up with that. If you want to follow Jesus, you don't say, I'll follow you someday. Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Oh, that's hard, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the most important thing we could do in our life is to follow Jesus Christ. And don't say to God, God, I really intend to do it someday. That day is today. That day is right now. And we just need to humble ourselves and give ourselves to the Lord and don't make excuses because Jesus will tell us, let the dead bury the dead. There are things more important. There are things more important going on. All right, let's look over now at uh, 22 through 27. 23 to 27. This is the fifth miracle recorded in the book of Matthew. <coughs> Actually, there's been thousands of miracles, I think, by this time, but he just says a bunch of healings, and that counts as one. So, uh, Miracle working Savior. When we think the situation is dip too hard in our life, brothers and sisters, God can do it. We worship a God. The supernatural is natural for God. Just keep that in mind. The supernatural is natural for God. Uh, nobody, this situation is impossible. Nobody can help me. I, I don't know what to do. That's a good place to do. Say, God, I don't know what to do. I just want to follow you. God, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to trust you in this. That's not a bad place to be. Scary place to be. Not a bad place to be. Okay, from verse 23, and we're going to go all the way to 27. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. So he's going to leave this crowd after people coming up to him and saying, I want to follow you, I want to follow you. He's going to go to the other side. Uh... His disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious, furious storm came up. Now, this is the story where Jesus is asleep in the boat. So either he was asleep faster than suddenly, or Jesus was very comfortable sleeping while everything is breaking free all around him. Things are, things are going crazy, and he falls asleep. Jesus is probably exhausted after that, all the sermon and all the work and all the helping for people and the miracles he's been doing. 
Uh, then Jesus got into a boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. I don't know, as he's getting covered with waves or what. Uh, the disciples went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us. We're going to perish. We're going to drown. <coughs> and I don't know. He, he wakes up and he says, I don't know if he had a kind of a sleepy voice. Oh, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Or, or whether he woke up like that. But he, he says, what's wrong with you guys? I'm with you. I still have a mission to do. You think the boat's going down? Oh, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves. And it was completely calm guess they had a pretty big impression on those fellas because look at the next line verse 27 the men were amazed and they said to one another what kind of man is this even the winds and the waves obey him we've been saying imagine you're in that first century church and the matthew gospel the matthew manuscript has arrived at your church and they're probably reading it through all in one setting and you come to this place, and you just look at one another. Even if you heard the story before, told verbally, it's just beautiful to hear it said once again, we worship a God who's in command of the wind, in command of the storm. J. Vernon McGee, famous Bible scholar, points out that Peter and John and the other disciples, they showed very little faith here. They cried out, Lord, don't you care that we're going to die? Don't you care? Have you ever felt like that, that God doesn't care about you where you're at? God, don't you even care what's going on in my life? They didn't stay young in their faith, though. They grew up. They grew up. They grew up in the power of the Holy Spirit. A few years later, J. Vernon McGee pointed out, I thought this was beautiful, they're facing deadly persecution and they didn't pray to God, God, don't you care what's going on down here? Instead, facing deadly persecution, the church is being attacked. They pray, and now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants. What? Great boldness to keep preaching your word. They've changed. They changed in a few years from where they were. They were becoming more like Jesus. Because that's the effect that God has on us. Remember, we've been... <laughs> We've been talking about that, that big old 16-wheeler. If, if you want to play on a highway, and you're going to you're go chase down a ball or something, and this 16-wheeler is coming, you are going to encounter the 16-wheeler. It's going to make an impression on you. The 16-wheeler is big. You will not leave that encounter unaffected. God is bigger than a 16-wheeler. Amen? If we're going to get close to God, we can't walk away from that unaffected. These disciples who said, don't you care about us? Wake up, we're going to die. Later, facing death, they say, God, give us strength to keep on preaching. That's beautiful. These are changed people. For them, staying with Jesus meant going through storms and going through storms of persecution. Did you see that? If they hadn't followed Jesus, they would not have been out on the lake. They wouldn't have experienced a storm. And if they hadn't followed Jesus, they would not have experienced a storm of persecution. I told you a little while ago, there's some trouble that is common to man. There's some trouble that everybody in this world has to face. There is special trouble allotted to you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. But praise God, our Lord is bigger than this world. And I would rather, rather endure the difficulty. If walking close to Jesus means that the people throwing rocks at him occasionally hit me, that's still better to walk next to my blessed Savior who loved me and died for me and has given me this beautiful life than to turn my back on the one who died for me and walk into eternity into darkness. There's a lot of folks out there throwing stones at Jesus. You're going to pick up a stone with them? You want to fit in? You just going to turn your back and ignore it and walk away? Or are you going to walk with the Lord, even though it might mean extra trouble? 
could be trouble at work. Could be trouble at Thanksgiving time, right? Those family reunions. Could be trouble with our neighbors. We have to make a choice. We have to make a choice. This freedom God has given us. Everyone in this fallen world must endure the threat of storms and other natural disasters. They had a, what, a 6.5 out in California this week? But only those who love Jesus will have to face the storm of being persecuted because of that love. For the disciples, following God and going on the path of least resistance were not the same thing. Did you catch that? Following God and walking on the path of least resistance were not the same thing. Jesus goes difficult places, and he calls us to do difficult things. The next scene recorded by Matthew, we're not going to read it. It involves demon possession and a herd of pigs. And if that doesn't entice you to read your scriptures, I don't know what will. That's a hook. A whole herd of pig and, and, and a, what do you call a herd of pigs? Is that right? Is that okay? A whole bucket of pigs or something? And it's called bacon. There you go. <laughs> and, and a couple demon-possessed guys. Uh, but the part of the story that really stuck out to me, the part of the story that's really interested me is, and maybe why Matthew included it right here in this section, right here in this difficult section, is that Christ casts out these two demons. Christ is loving people. He's doing the right thing. He brings peace of mind and hope to these poor, demonized men. We see Jesus doing things out of love, and it makes his own life less easy. Love, by definition, is often inconvenient. I don't like rejection. I've, had, uh, I've lost a few people over the years that I wanted to hang around with, that I, I thought we were going to do church together. I thought we were going to be buddies forever, and they decided they didn't want to be around me, and, and some of that is painful. But I've never had a whole crowd of people uh, plead with me to leave the way this group, Jesus, by the way, I don't want to give you guys anything to think about. <laughs> let's, just <e> yeah, <laughs> let's just erase that. Jesus does something out of love, and the response is a whole crowd of people plead with him, please leave us, get out of here. We don't want you. That's rejection. For Christ, doing the right thing didn't mean the path of least resistance. I'm hammering this point home because of this lie that we have that every open door is from God. It's not. The person, uh, I was talking to a person this week, and I was telling him that a Christian should always be the best worker. In your workplace, if you're a Christian, you should be a great worker. You should not be a complainer. You should not be late, perpetually late. You should be reliable and trustworthy. You should make it God, every morning say, God, I want to be a joy to my boss and a blessing to the people around me. If there's customers, you ought to bring a little light into their life. Don't call the workplace, my workplace, you don't understand, Pastor, my workplace is dark. Bring the light. Don't call it God forsaken. God hasn't forsaken it in, <laughs> because technically you're there and you're carrying Jesus Christ with you, right? Be the light. Be the light. That's why you're there. A Christian should always strive to be the best worker in their workplace. And the person I was talking to responded by saying, oh, that's hard. And my answer to that was, yeah, God has a habit of asking us to do hard things. That's what God does. The world just goes and, and the river goes where the course is carved. The world says, don't shock, rock the boat. Jesus comes along, he sinks the boat. God does things differently than the world. And think of it, God himself was willing to do a very difficult thing when he allowed nails to hammer him to a cross. He was spit on, he was cursed by his own people, by his own creation. He did that for me. He did that for you. If he's willing to go to them hard places to save my miserable behind, where's, 
Where are we going to answer the call when he asks us to go somewhere? When he asks us to love somebody, forgive somebody, when it's not convenient, when it's not easy, when it's hard? Or are we just going to go traipsing along, path of least resistance, open doors? I really think the Holy Spirit wants me to try to fix my relationship with my dad. But God opened a door for me. To, oh, maybe that's not God opening that door. Right? God calls us to do unpopular, sacrificial, difficult, painful things all the time. To speak truth when lies are more convenient. And you speak a lie, you can get a big crowd. And you can be better accepted. You can become more popular. God calls us to stand up and, and defend an outcast. Have you ever done that? There's somebody at the workplace or at school and everybody's picking on them. You even stand next to this person, you're afraid they're going to turn on you. And to make it worse, sometimes they're unkind to you. You try to help them and they're rude and cruel. There's a reason they're unpopular, right? And Jesus, you just know Jesus wants you to pour love on that person. You just know God wants to love that person through you. God asks us to do difficult things. God asks us to stay in a marriage when it's not all fun and games anymore. God asks us to read our Bible when Gilligan's Island is on television. To pray when we don't feel like it. To tithe our time, talents, and treasures to the Lord. To wake up on Sunday morning instead of going to Bedside Baptist. To share our trust in Jesus with everyone we can. God calls us to do difficult things. They're good things. They're beautiful things. They're wonderful things. Some of these things are obviously harder than others, but they all involve denying ourselves and taking a more difficult path than we could or we would if we didn't have love for God in our hearts. Maybe that's why Christ spoke of a wide and narrow road in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember that? The wide road led to destruction. i got to hear that again. The wide road leads to? Yeah, that's the easy path. That's the path of least resistance. The narrow road, few people find it. That means it's not as well trod. Maybe it's a little uneven. It's a difficult road. It's got a much better scenery, by the way. You follow the Lord's path, it's going to take you to some beautiful places. It's not an easy hike, but it's wonderful, and it's beautiful, and the destination is eternal life. The destination is paradise. We need to put God first in everything. It means bowing to him and saying, God, thy will be done. It means trusting God with the things we don't understand. It means following the word of God even when we don't feel like it. And I'm there on a regular basis, and I have to say, no, Lord, your way is better than Dan's way. My way keeps blooding my head on that wall. Or as Jesus himself put it later in the book of Matthew, Jesus said, if anyone wishes to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and walk with me every day. Let's do that. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a, a way maker, Lord, that you open doors for us, that you take impossible situations and you just bring something beautiful out of it, Lord. God, we thank you that you're a miracle-working God. When, when there's no hope, you bring hope. But we also pray, Lord, that you give us discernment, that you give us wisdom, that we, we put your word first, and, Lord, that we don't, just because you open doors, Lord, that we don't think that that means the path of least resistance is the way we should go. Father, help us to fight for our marriages. Help us to fight for our children. Help us to fight for this church, Lord, and not just go the easy way. Lord, help us to forgive and to love, even though these things are inconvenient, oftentimes painful, and never easy. Lord, we want to love you. We want to love each other in the church with an undying and passionate love. And Lord, give us a love for people who don't know you yet. Lord, the same kind of love that Jesus Christ had while hanging on the cross. Father, we're, we're hypocritical to think 
that we're good and we're righteous on our own. Lord, all the goodness comes from you. We just thank you for the cross and your forgiveness and your grace. Help us to be, help us to be like you, Father. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray this. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.